Bangladesh is a country about the size of Arkansas or Pennsylvania with half the population of the United States crammed into its borders. There are about 165 million Bengali Muslims, which comprise the world's largest unreached people group. In the fall of 1998, I was traveling by train across the Gobi Desert from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia to Beijing, China. On that 26-hour train ride, the Lord touched my heart and prompted me to read once again through the book of Acts. As I read through the book of Acts and Paul's missionary journeys, God again touched my heart about what I should do moving forward in regard to missionary effort. And uh, the thing that I felt so distinctly and clearly in my heart was that I should go to the hard places, the last places, the places on the ragged edge, the places that get the least access to the gospel. And so I came home and through a series of events, God opened a door for me to travel to Bangladesh. And so in 1999, I came to Bangladesh. I just felt this compelling, strong conviction that that's where I should be and that's where I should lead others to go. We use a phrase all the time at Kingsland. We say, go beyond. It's a phrase that was born in the heart of Omar and his heart for moving outside of your comfort zone. But we use it so often that actually it's a part of our mission, our vision statement. We talk about four domains of true fulfillment and a part of being fulfilled, remember, is to step outside of our comfort zone into that place beyond. Well, beyond, going beyond doesn't just mean doing things that are risky for no reason. It, it's, it's more than that. It's stepping outside of our comfort zone in the name of Jesus. And we see a picture of that in a beautiful place in the New Testament. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter eight. It's a passage that really em emphasizes what this means to move outside of our comfort zone in order to be the hands and feet of Christ. So. Acts 8, 26 through 40 tells the account of Philip. Remember, he was one of the first deacons back in Acts chapter 6, and he was later called Philip the Evangelist. But he's doing productive ministry in Samaria. And back in verse 26, this is what we read. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and go to the road that goes down to, from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So the Lord is telling Philip to go down to the desert. And by the way, he didn't even know why yet. He was just trusting in order to do that. And when he gets there to the desert, he finds out why he's there. Verse 27 says, so he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on the way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. This is a pretty amazing passage right here because this, this is saying, saying a lot. I want you to understand the Ethiopian empire for which this speaks was considered the ends of the earth at this time. So he's, he's going to someone who is going to the ends of the earth. Now don't think of modern day Ethiopia. It's really more like Northern Sudan where the Ethiopian empire was at this time. And when you read about Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, uh, don't think of Candace as a name, although it's a nice name. Candace is a name for the queen. So it's sort of like saying Pharaoh. It, it, it's a name that was given to the queen. And incidentally, Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, also had a, a, a king. So she had, she was married to the king. You wonder why is that? It's very similar to uh, what you read about the pharaohs in Egypt uh, in ancient times, in that they had sort of a pharaoh system, and they believed that their kings were like uh, gods, little gods. And so it was beneath them to do the work of governing. So they would leave that to the women. Now, thankfully, that's the only culture in the history of mankind where men felt like some work was beneath them, right? Well, let's move on with that note. So this wasn't just any man from the Ethiopian empire. He was 
uh, basically the treasury secretary of the nation. He'd made great sacrifices personally in order to be in that position. Uh, we see that he was a eunuch. Now, let me put this in PG terms, all right? When kings had men in higher up positions that were around the castle, the kings didn't want a guy who would be you know, available to his wives and his women. And so they became eunuchs. You can imagine the sacrifice that was made. But it's not just that he was not married. Do you understand? This meant he was alone. There was a brokenness about this man such that he was longing, he was searching and seeking for something more. So much so that he took a journey, that round trip probably took about a year in order to go to Jerusalem and learn more. He had somehow heard, uh, maybe in the in the Israel Israeli dispersion, uh, he'd heard about uh, this God, and he had come to learn more. And so he's come to Jerusalem, he's seeking God, and apparently all the rituals that had taken place there had left him wanting more. In fact, we know from the Old Testament that because he's a eunuch, he would not have even been able to participate in the worship. And so here's what happens next. Look at verse 29. The Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? What a good question. You know, sometimes when you're having conversations with someone and you're not really sure how to have, have you know, bring up a conversation about spiritual things, it's so good to ask a question. Like what questions are so great because that gives that person an opportunity to share their story. And I think that's so important. And so he says, do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, how can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. Incidentally, before I read it, do you know that this passage the man was reading was from Isaiah 53? I don't think it's any coincidence because Isaiah 53 is one of the most messianic passages in the Old Testament. It has more to say about Jesus, about Messiah and Savior than any other passage and he had been led there. But I'll tell you something else. I wonder whether he was reading from Isaiah around this area because he had already read it and was rereading or had been pointed to this passage from somebody else. Because do you know what we find in Isaiah 56, verses three and four? Isaiah 56, verse three says this, no foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord should say, the Lord will exclude me from his people. And the eunuch should not say, I am a dried up tree. And so he goes on to give promises to the eunuch. So you can imagine what hope that has, but now he, he's been to the Temple Mount. He has been left wanting, thinking there has to be more. Uh, I have been excluded. How can I have an opportunity to enter in? And he's reading in the Old Testament about a Messiah who will come and along comes Philip to share. Now, look at the passage and let's read what he was reading from Isaiah 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe this generation? For his life is taken from the earth. It says there, the eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? And Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. Now, I love that because he wasn't just going to have a spiritual conversation as if all spiritual conversations are even. It's important that we come to a place where we, we talk about Jesus. You know, being in Bangladesh these last several days, I've met some of the most amazing people, very kind people who believe differently than we do. And, and it's wonderful that they have a sense of, of uh, someone who is greater than us and a sense of God. They even have a sense, an understanding that there is a, a need for a savior. They know that they're sinners, but I would be doing a great disservice. We would be doing a great disservice if we didn't share the hope that comes only through Jesus. Do you see? such a blessing that we can bring it there. So Philip brings him back to the good news of Jesus. And listen, I know there's probably some uh, who will watch this or witness this who say, you know what? There's probably lots of paths to goodness or wholeness or, or heaven. And the reality is that, that salvation and hope is available through only one. And that's the Lord Jesus, right? 
So after this, the eunuch clearly places his trust in Jesus Christ. He asks to be baptized and he is baptized at that very place. And I love this passage for a lot of reasons, but I wanna share with you uh, the most important reason for this day and this time, standing in this place, in this uh, community, uh, very near a home that houses uh, some, some dear brothers who are sharing the love of Jesus Christ in such a place that, that they have to go to a, a safe house for protection, really. Uh, so they're, they're not harmed for their faith. And um, I, I so admire them. They asked me to come in and teach them today. And I told them, I want to sit down and take notes and listen to you because they just have such a passion about their Lord that's contagious. But you know what? God hasn't just called them to go beyond beyond their comfort zone to share the love of Christ. God has called me to go beyond and share the love of Christ. God has called you to go beyond. And even those who might be watching, you're just trying to check out the things of God. You know deep in your heart that you'll never be fulfilled until you go beyond. You step outside of your comfort zone and you live for something beyond yourself, right? So there's, there's two primary foundational principles that we must really believe or we will never go beyond. We'll never do it. Can I share those with you? The first principle of going beyond is this. The gospel is for everyone, everyone on earth. Our mission statement at Kingsland begins this way, inviting all people. Those are so important because the, the, our mission comes with the promise that the gospel is available for every person on earth. And we see this here in the passage in Acts 8. It's really important to understand how different the Ethiopian eunuch was from Philip. I know how often God's, I, I just love how often God brings people together from vastly different worlds. Here is Philip, who seems to be a typical middle-class Jew. And this eunuch from Ethiopia is a rich, powerful foreigner. And this is just one example of God reaching beyond walls that people have established between people. In fact, in the very next chapter, you see uh, not only now a wealthy African has come to faith, but we have Paul, a zealous killer of Christians coming to faith. And then the next chapter in chapter 10, Cornelius, a Roman centurion warrior comes to faith. Over and over again, the scriptures remind us that there is no one culture to which Christianity belongs more than one another. Uh, it is such a misnomer uh, that, that Christianity is a Western faith. It's just not true. There's a book called Whose Religion is Christianity? And it's been written by a Yale professor uh, from Africa named Laman Sauna. And uh, Sana, he is, he's a really interesting guy. And he notes in his book that all the major religions in the world, except Christianity, it, they have one thing in common. If you look at their base, they're all based at the center of where they were formed. Now, we're in Bangladesh, a, a large concentration, one of the largest in the world of, of those of the Muslim faith. But we also know that the center still uh, of, of Islam is right where it started. We see the same with Buddhism, Confucianism, anything that you want to name is right there. But Christianity, not so. We see Christianity spread to the far reaches of the earth because it is universally recognized that we are desperate for a savior. And all things point to the book, the Bible, as being reliable. And then we also see that Jesus is like no other who ever lived. And so we see, guess what? The gospel is for everyone. This is a, a Sufi shrine. Uh, you may know that uh, that's the tomb for the Sufi guru, and these are the followers of Sufi. It's very difficult to uh, share the gospel to, to someone of Islam without offense uh, in Bangladesh. However, uh, this particular sect of Muslims, the Sufi, are open to music. They, they're the only ones who have music. And so we found that they would allow us to tell the gospel through song. And so it opened a door uh, for the gospel to work. There's a gentleman uh, who serves in this village who is sharing the gospel, sharing Christ uh, through song. I spent yesterday with talking about Empowered Homes, Family Ministry, uh, but he's doing work among these really kind people. They have been nothing but kind to us as uh, we get to share the hope of Christ.
After the dawn, uh, I just took a chance to share the gospel with them briefly because uh, we had short time in hand. So I just uh, began to share about Jesus, Jesus in the Quran, and I just uh, shared some uh, verses from Quran that talks about Jesus and uh, Jesus' birth and uh, his miraculous activities. And they said, oh yes, they immediately realized that, oh yes, Jesus is in, in, in Quran, uh, and he is a kind of a uh, special prophet. And uh, anyone who believes, he will get the salvation. So, and then they said, oh yeah. And I said, uh, do you think that you are sinners? They said, yes, we are sinners. I said that there is only holy man in this wo world, that is Jesus, and who came to this earth for sinners, and he gave his life uh, as a sacrifice for our, for sinners. And anyone who uh, believes in him and accepts in him, he will get salvation. And I said, would you like to hear more about Jesus? And they said, yes, please come back again. And that was really awesome and fantastic. And I, we are planning planning to go back again and do some follow up with them. And it's just a reminder again that we we are so wrong when we think that Christianity is an American or Western faith. It's it's simply not. Uh, God is working all over the world, sometimes in more powerful ways than what we see in the states. Bangladesh is located right in the center of the 1040 window. To me, it's symbolic. It represents the challenge of reaching the unreached, of reaching people who live on the ragged edge. If we could configure a map of the world into concentric circles and place all the nations on the earth on that map based on the status of their evangelization, you and I would live in the fertile center and the people of Bangladesh would live on the arid and very ragged edge. And it's important that we be as strategic as possible when it comes to sharing the gospel. And that means getting the gospel to those who live farthest from the bakery, those who don't even get crumbs of the gospel. I hope that we never forget that the gospel is for everyone. But there's an important fact that goes along with it that we also find in Acts chapter eight. And when we understand these two convictions together, they will be life-changing and they will cause us, stir us to go beyond. The first, the gospel is for everyone. Here's the second, the mission takes sacrifice. Every single time in the word of God, when God calls someone, you see sacrifice, you see challenges. And that doesn't mean that we go looking for trouble as Christians and things ought to be miserable. No, there's joy in the challenge, in stretching ourselves, in stepping outside of our comfort zone every single time. And that was the same case in Acts 8. Remember when I mentioned that Philip had a strong ministry happening in uh, Samaria? Uh, when, when the Holy Spirit called him to the desert, uh, things seemed to be going great for Philip. He had gone to Samaria to minister. Uh, now remember, he had come from the Jerusalem church and I have to wonder if he was just following exactly the plan that the Lord had put on his heart. In Acts 1.8, when Jesus gave the great commission, he said, remember, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. So he had, he had gone to Samaria, he took it literally. And these are despised people. He went and started to share the good news and people responding in amazing ways. Acts chapter eight, verse eight actually says, there was great joy in the city. That sounds like a great place to minister. Didn't mean there weren't any problems. We had Simon the sorcerer who had kind of faked his faith and that was exposed. It wasn't easy, but it was a nice place to be. I wonder whether Philip wanted to settle down, build a house, start a family, stay there. So this is a good place to minister. Good things are happening. And then lo and behold, God says, no, I want you to go to another place, a harder place. I want you to go from a place where there's lots of people to listen, where there will only be one. And that's where I'm calling you. I'm calling you to go beyond. Verse 26, the spirit of the Lord is telling Philip to get uncomfortable. And I wonder, I ask myself, I've asked so many times this week, uh, am I willing to be uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel? Because I, I don't think you can go beyond until you're willing to be uncomfortable. Go, going beyond rarely involves a convenient path. And I believe that the inconvenience to which we're called is almost always going to call for uh, some specific ways that we're, we're, we're called to stretch ourselves. 
and uh, and be willing to get uncomfortable. I think part of that is has to do with location. That was the case with Philip. He had to get uncomfortable and step outside of his comfort zone to go to the desert in order to encounter this man. Sometimes being uncomfortable involves your location. Maybe God's going to call you to serve somewhere in the world or to go. Yes, but not everybody. It, it may be crossing the street to go to that neighbor and have a conversation and love them well. It may be moving across to someone you see who is hurting or having difficulty or challenges. Uh, children, I, I want you to know that one of the, the things that the Lord really put on my wife Lana's heart as we were raising our girls is she was a school teacher. And she said, so often there's that one child who's off to him or herself and is sort of despised by the others. And she said, I want to raise children that go across the room and find that kid and love that kid well. And I love that our girls were raised with that heart of compassion that they still exhibit in looking with those eyes to move in the direction of somebody who might be hurting. And I think it's really interesting now that later on, the Lord has given our family, you know, a, a special needs daughter, someone that sometimes the world looks at and says, I just don't know what to do with her. And so we count on people to move in the direction and love her well uh, as Jesus would. Well, in the same way, God is going to call some of us, all of us really, to be uncomfortable as, as it goes with location. But I'll tell you another way that I think that sometimes we have to be uncomfortable, and that is with relationships. I mean, you have to take the step to talk about Jesus. And, and I know that's not always easy, but maybe, maybe to find a way to ask the question and say, tell me your story of faith and not just have ongoing relationship for years where people don't even know uh, that you love, love the Lord Jesus. But I'll tell you another way that always shows up in scripture that's very important. I think God calls us to be uncomfortable with regards to our resources, our finances. And, and I know that sometimes that's not easy to talk about, but the reality is, when we look at all the incredible work that's happened all around Bangladesh these last few days, and God's doing amazing work, this is all through seeds that have been planted for years. And, and you need to know, those who have given sacrificially, that when you're sleeping at night, we're, we're 11 hours ahead, God is doing a great work through those, those resources. We have seen some amazing things. We have seen, we have seen sacrifices that have been made such that there, is a, there, are, there are pastors being trained. Do you know, yesterday something amazing happened. I had the privilege of spending the entire day training a group of pastors with regard to how to empower homes and, and how to, to strengthen families and how by doing that to share the love of Christ. Spent about seven hours with these wonderful men and women. I got uh, a photo on my phone about two hours after we were done. Uh, we'd had a chance to go one other place and we were on our way back to the hotel. And it was a picture of one of those pastors who'd been with me all day, surrounded by another group of pastors. And he was teaching the same material two hours later. And I think about how we'd been praying that God would allow us to see 1 million homes, 1 million seven homes transformed by the power of the gospel. And I think that's how it's gonna happen. When somebody gets that vision and they say, no, I'm gonna go. And in the same way, we see the multiplication of that vision. We see the multiplication of dollars here that have been given. And this is true in every ministry, but that doesn't happen until somebody gets uncomfortable. And I think the Lord transforms our hearts when we move from saying, okay, I know I'm supposed to give a little bit and sort of tipping God to saying, no, I want to make a sacrifice. And that means I might need to change my vacation plans. I might need to change how we spend our dollars on a regular basis because I want to go beyond and to step outside of my comfort zone and say it's not going to affect my wallet. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's counterintuitive. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense. God has called us to do something. Do you know that even as we're going through a recession, that the United States is one of the most prosperous nations, if not the most prosperous in the history of the world. God has done some great things raising up huge churches around the United States. Do you think that God has given us all these resources so that we can have longer vacations or bigger cars and houses, that sort of thing? Or could it be that God has entrusted us with these resources because he's given us the means in this time and place in history to share the gospel with people like never before? and those dollars go further than they ever have before. And that includes work that happens all around the world like this one, among our many, many partners. It also includes what happens right around the church as we do that. So I pray that God would continue to call us to go beyond by getting uncomfortable in ways through our, our resources, our location, our finances. Those are so important, why? Because God is inviting us today 
to go beyond. Now, what's the standard of getting uncomfortable? What are we supposed to be willing to do in stepping outside of our comfort zone? You know what the standard is? The standard of discomfort for the sake of the mission is found in 1 John 3, 16. Listen to this verse. This is how we have come to know love. He, Jesus, laid down his life for us. So Jesus is the model we look to. And Jesus, of course, gave what? He gave himself for the sake of the mission. He's, he wanted to see lives restored to the Father. So what should we be willing to do? Here's the rest of the verse. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That sounds like going beyond. And that sounds impossible without stepping outside of our comfort zone and making a sacrifice. Incidentally, in our time here in Bangladesh, we've come across multiple accounts of people who were willing to do just that. The gospel is for everyone and the mission takes sacrifice. I want to introduce you to a longtime partner of Kingsland and someone who knows the, the importance of sacrifice very well. This is Manan. Life was very, uh, 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 it's uh, like a uh, difficulty because uh, my father, he has uh, two wives. And also, you know, that my physically, I am like a disability in my hand. When I'm like a born, my father, uh, three months, he not see my face because he's, uh, he saw, oh, it's uh, not my, uh, it's uh, my fault or my wife's fault. I don't see this son. So my father all time like negligency or like a, not, a, I'm not important uh, boy or important in this family, so. Almost sent like a team, 14 Bibles, different 14 people they receive. I am reading the Bible and then I saw the Genesis first. So how God creas created the, the earth. And so it's very nice, it's a wonderful history. So I'm reading and that time I'm like deeply th thinking what is happening? What is the truth? Uh, radical Islamic people and uh, also like Islamic leaders, they like uh, collected all Bibles and they said, oh, it's a, uh, please, this is a wrong book and it's a very uh, like a corrupted by the American peoples and American missionaries. So that time, like uh, my Bible, I'm not saying, okay, I can read, this is my freedom. I can read, this is wrong, okay, I'm like it take off. But why I cannot read, it's a, not truth and then, my dad says, please, you go out from my house. So, because you are not like a, uh, obey to my, my comments. Community people pressure him. Oh, your son like a, he's a, not obey. He's a educated uh, boy, but he's a not like a, obey. So how you can like, a, you can say your, this is your son. My mom is crying, she is very humble. I'm finished my like a 12 class and I came to Dhaka. I'm going to door to door for the tuition. I go to my dormitory. When I'm knock the door and one guy, he's my friend, I open the door and say, hey, I'm Anand, so please. And all my shirt and pant and my bag, my friends say, you're not living here. This is a not dormitory for the Christian students. And then uh, it's uh, evening time, so Islamic uh, is radical uh, guy, scholar, he bring all the Bibles, 13 pieces, and then said, okay, everybody give back. And then says, okay, maybe some, uh, we call the kerosene, fuel, and then psh, and they burn it. So they're burning the Bibles? Yeah. And they wanted you to throw yours in too? You know, it's my Bible, I'm not like a, give the back. Now I understood that my Lord's so it's strong in my heart. And I understood that. One time when I understood the Bible says, you like forgiveness your enemies and you pray for them and I still pray for them. When I start the prayer for my village and many people came to the Christ from my community. So my family now, you know that my younger brother, two brothers, my two sisters, my mom, everybody, now they're living the Christ. So wonderful time. It's a God's plan for like to save my family, save my many souls, unreached souls. So now I understood very clear. So why I'm like a, uh, keep strongly, why I'm like not giving the very easily, 
why I'm like uh, debating with them. So everything like I, I, I understood very clear, I am not doing. Heavenly Father tell me, please you tell. If I'm very happy and I'm very like grateful. So my Heavenly Father, he has a plan on my life. I understood very clear. So my earthly father, my physical, biological father, dad, see, don't see me and don't like me. I'm not important in his life, but I saw Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ. He saw me and he loves me. Our partners are serving in hard places all around the world. But we know that not everybody is called to serve in such places. Many of us are called to serve right where we are, right where God has placed you. And I'm grateful for the freedoms that the Lord has given us to share the good news about Jesus right where we live. We need to take advantage of those freedoms. But I know this, we're never going to do anything that's seen as difficult or beyond until we have two profoundly firm com convictions that the gospel is for everyone and that the mission takes sacrifice. Now, I want to share one more truth with you that we find in the passage here. One last thing from Acts chapter 8. Notice back in verse 26, it says, an angel of the Lord told Philip to get up and leave. Have you ever wondered why God didn't just send that angel to speak directly to the Ethiopian eunuch? And I'll tell you why. Because God loves using people. He loves using people to go beyond. Incidentally, God could do whatever he wants. Why does he call us to pray? Because God delights in his people asking great things of him. Just like God called uh, through the angel, Philip, to go, uh, he's calling you to go and me to go. And so that's only going to happen when we remember these two important points. Listen, the gospel is for everyone. The mission takes sacrifice. And so that's why we are engaged in a place like Bangladesh, because it's far, because it's hard, because it's difficult, because it's last. It's a place that is longing to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ.